My name is Hoyne, I'm a consultant psychiatrist, professor of psychiatry and editor of Global Psychiatry Archives. Uh, today in, I want to uh, talk about simple or specific phobias and uh, it's the anxiety, excessive anxiety and unreasonable uh, autonomic symptoms of anxiety such as sweating or shaking um, in the presence of unfeared object or which can be there, or which can be anticipated. And this usually leads to avoidance and the differences in uh, types, um, depending on the classifications, what the types are animals, natural environment, blood injection, injury situations or whatever. The prevalence is about uh, in lifetime about 10 to 15%. Uh, if you look at uh, the 12 months prevalence, it's less, slightly less than, than 10%. Usually there are more females, so one, two, three, one, nine, three females, and animals and uh, situational phobias might be more common in women. The usual age of onset is quite young, 15 years, and depends on than the um, situation. There's some genetic contributions which we can see when we compare monozygotic and dizygotic twins. The higher the rate that the, um, the or the higher these pre uh, percentages of similar symptoms in monozygotic uh, versus dizygotic twins, then you have a higher genetic environment. Reason being that my monozygotic twins share more of the genes, um, or they have the same genes, nearly 99% or even more, and dizygotic twins only have 50% of the genes together. So if you then have something which in monozygotic twins is 100% and in dizygotic twins is 50%, then you would assume, assume that it's a very strong genetic um, contribution to the disease. There's some psychoanalytical theories, you know, that there's some uh, unconscious conflict which relates to the symbolic representation of some things like an animal, and this can then lead to phobia. Usually phobias have this nice little Greek names, so like arachnophobia, the fear of spiders, Ophidiophobia, fear of snakes, acrophobia, fear of heights, agoraphobia, crowded spaces, xenophobia, dogs, astrophobia, thunder, lightning, claustrophobia, enclosed spaces, musophobia, germs, aerophobia, fear of flying, trypophobia, fear of holes, carcinophobia, fear of cancer, and um, others including death, public speaking, being alone, fear of failure, fear of birds, fear of chicken, fear of crowds, and so on. So the question is on uh, that, what do you do with that? Uh, um, there's lots of comorbidity as well, um, which sometimes has to be treated first. There are lots of panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, mood disorder, which have some comorbidity. And um, we spoke about these uh, theories about how it can be. So there might be something that has been learned wrong. And in some, some, you know, some whatever trigger has caused anxiety, and then this trigger is associated or mentally associated with the uh, anxiety and the trigger. And then in this respect, you know, let's say if you something happens, you, you harm yourself, when something is present or is more often present, then you can uh, learn something wrong. Right, uh, the differential diagnosis is panic disorder, OCD, um, other disorders which uh, usually have anxiety and avoidance with it. So there might be some, uh, some, let's say it that way, if people just think they spend their life thinking about heights or spiders and think they have uh, specific forces, then something might be seen as uh, 
paranoid and not uh, more not just a phobia right what do we do what's the treatment it's behavioral therapy so trying to avoid uh, the anxiety there's something we call flooding when people just have contact with the spider or something like that until the um, anxiety wanes off and gets less there's um, some reciprocal inhibition so trying to inhibit the response cognitive methods try, are tried so trying to understand where the anxiety come where the trigger is and trying to cognitively restructure what has been learned before um, to cope with anxiety or the physical aspect with the anxiety very often beta blockers are given and sometimes if the anxiety is very severe benzodiazepines are given the problem is that sometimes this can lead to addiction because benzos can be very uh, strong and uh, uh, very often liked by patients and they can relax with this um, medication and then they want more and more and as it's um, what addiction is addiction is when the medication needs to be given more and more to get the same effect and when it's not given anymore the symptoms get worse and people get withdrawal symptoms usually usually anxiety this type of anxiety or phobias are chronic they then very often stay over the years sometimes people can avoid the trigger and then they can live a normal life but uh, sometimes the anxiety can be very extreme and people might waste their life by avoiding triggers which might be seen completely normal by others i hope you like this talk um, the whole idea of these talks is more or less to increase the mental health literacy of people the idea of mental health literacy is that the more we know about our mental health problems the better we can name it the better we can recognize it the better we can deal with other people appropriately the more we can learn the more we can avoid the stigma of mental health problems and we can guide people better into care or support say by a GP or psychiatrist. Thanks for your interest and if you want to hear more of that please check our YouTube channel Global Psychiatry Archives. Thanks a lot and have a nice evening.